Hi. Uh, last time we introduced heat in the context of energy conservation and the first law of thermodynamics. Today we're going to talk about uh, some more about the actual heat transfer, in particular the rate of heat flow from one place to another. Um, the two mechanisms we're going to talk about are conduction and radiation. Uh, these are the two mechanisms of heat flow which don't actually involve the motion of hot materials. Uh, energy goes from one place to another, but all the matter actually stays put. Uh, today's video is going to be a little bit more qualitative than normal. I'll just be presenting the equations, um, maybe some motivation and an example, but without really any derivations. Um, all right, so here we go. The most basic and well-known rule of heat transfer is that heat flows from hot to cold. To be more precise, if a hot object is brought into thermal contact with a cold object, then heat will flow from the hot object to the cold object. As the heat flows, the hot object will get colder, and the cold object will get hotter, until so both approach some equilibrium temperature that's between the two starting temperatures. This final state where the two objects have the same temperature is called thermal equilibrium. Thermal contact can occur in many ways. The two types that we're going to study in this video are conduction and radiation. First we consider conduction, which is heat flow that occurs when two objects of differing temperatures are physically touching each other. Our specific setup for conduction will be two objects which are connected by a conducting rod. You can think of the heat flowing down this rod like water flowing through a pipe. The rate of heat flow, which is the heat flow per unit time, depends on the properties of the rod and the objects. First, the rate of heat flow is proportional to the difference in temperatures between the hot object and the cold object. The bigger the difference in temperatures, the faster the heat flow. Drawing on the water flowing through a pipe analogy, the rate of heat flow is also proportional to the cross-sectional area A of the rod. In a moment, we'll explain why it's inversely proportional to the length of the rod. Finally, depending on the material the rod is made of, there is a thermal conductivity constant, K. Another useful analogy for developing intuition besides the water flowing through a pipe is an object sliding down a ramp. The difference in temperatures corresponds to the height of the ramp, and the length of the rod corresponds to the length of the base of the ramp. A steeper ramp is easier to slide down. Finally, the cross-sectional area is like the size of the object which is sliding. We can get a lot of mileage out of the equation by considering our objects being connected by two rods, possibly with different properties. The first section of rod is labeled with quantity subscript 1, while the second section is labeled subscript 2. The key physical ingredient is that the total amount of heat per unit time flowing through each of the rods is the same. This is easiest to understand through the water in the pipe analogy. If the total amount of water flowing through the green pipe is not the same as the total amount flowing through the orange pipe, then that means either water is leaking out somewhere, or it's building up somewhere, and we don't want either of those. So we use the heat conduction equation on the two pipes separately, and set the QDTs equal to each other. Here I'm denoting the temperature at the junction between the two pipes by T. This is a very general sort of setup, and we're going to extract some information out of special cases. First, we'll consider two rods which are exactly the same except for their length. And second, we'll consider two rods which are exactly the same except for the materials they're made out of. That is, they'll have different thermal conductivities. The first example, where one of the rods has length x and the other has length l minus x, is really just a setup which allows us to solve for the temperature as a function of position along a single rod. That is, when we set the rate of heat flow along the first section of rod, equal to the rate of heat flow along the second section of rod, and solve for the temperature at the junction t, we're really solving for t as a function of x along the position of the rod. We know from the beginning that the temperature at one end of the rod is equal to th, and the temperature at the other end is equal to tc. And what this does is it allows us to see how the rod goes from th to tc along its length. After doing the algebra, we find that the temperature decreases linearly as a function of x. This is good news for the analogy we set up earlier, where we identified temperature as the height of the ramp, because of course the height of the ramp decreases linearly as one travels horizontally along the base of the ramp. The second example involves two rods, say one of metal and one of wood, which are of equal length and meet in the middle. 
The only difference between these two rods is their thermal conductivities K. So everything cancels out and we can solve for the temperature at the junction. We find that the temperature in the middle is a kind of weighted average between T hot and T cold, with the weightings depending on the relative thermal conductivities of the two materials. This means that the temperature difference across the rod with higher thermal conductivity is smaller. That's because the heat flows have to be the same across both, and the one with lower conductivity requires a higher temperature difference to maintain the same heat flow. In terms of our ramp analogy, if say K1 were the bigger conductivity, this would correspond to the first half of the ramp being very shallow, with the second half of the ramp being very steep. This gives us an indication of how we should think of the thermal conductivity in terms of the analogy. The thermal conductivity is sort of like a slipperiness of the ramp. The higher thermal conductivity, the easier it is to slide down the ramp. In the case of radiation, the objects do not have to be in physical contact for them to be in thermal contact. Radiation refers to the emission of light by any hot object. The wavelength of the radiated light depends on the temperature. A warm oven will emit mostly in the infrared. Hot coals begin to emit in the visible light, and something really hot like the sun can emit UV rays. Right now we're more interested in the total amount of radiated energy, which also depends on the temperature. The emitted energy per unit time, the power, follows the Stefan Boltzmann law. This law says that the power is proportional to temperature to the fourth. That's a very strong temperature dependence. It's also proportional to the surface area A of the object. Sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant and is a fundamental constant of nature. Finally, the emissivity is a dimensionless number between 0 and 1 which depends on the object. I'm not going to write down the numerical value of sigma, but I will note that it has units of power per area per temperature to the fourth, and using a combination of statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics, we can derive its expression in terms of uh, Boltzmann constant k, h-bar, and the speed of light. A typical setup for radiation problems consists of a hot radiating object and a cooler object farther away which absorbs the energy. Let's say this small target object is a distance d away from the source, and it has area A. Our objective will be to compute its temperature. The idea of these problems is that some total amount of power is being emitted at the surface of the source, and by the time it travels a distance d, it has been spread out over a gigantic sphere of radius d. The challenge is accounting for this spread. As a particular example, Let's take our source to be the sun, d to be the distance from the earth to the sun, and our object to be the earth. So this is the earth, and here are the sun's rays coming in and hitting it. We need to figure out what fraction of the power being emitted by the sun is being absorbed by the earth. The earth is sitting on a gigantic spherical shell, here denoted by the dotted line, which is a distance d from the sun. The total surface area of this shell is 4 pi times d squared. The fraction of the total power emitted from the sun, which is absorbed by the earth, is equal to the cross-sectional area of the earth divided by the area of this gigantic sphere. So the fraction of the sun's power, which actually hits the earth, is pi times the radius of the earth squared divided by 4 pi times the earth-sun distance squared. We're going to multiply this by the total power emitted by the sun, which, assuming that the emissivity of the sun is 1, is the surface area of the sun times sigma times the surface temperature of the sun to the fourth. Now we want to use this expression, which I've simplified, to find the temperature of the earth. If the earth has some finite temperature, then the earth must also be radiating, pictured here. If the earth's temperature is not changing, then that means the total energy entering the earth has to be the same as the total energy leaving the earth which means that the power emitted is the same as the power absorbed. The power emitted, assuming that the Earth has emissivity 1, is the surface area of the Earth times sigma times the temperature of the Earth to the fourth. And we can set this equal to the expression we already have for the power absorbed by the Earth. This method of computing the temperature of the Earth is admittedly very crude, but is surprisingly accurate and is the correct starting point for any more detailed calculation. Most of the factors cancel out of this equation, 
And when we solve it, we find a very simple relationship between the temperature of the Earth and the temperature of the Sun. Plugging in all the numbers, we find that our estimate is about 280 Kelvin. This is amazingly close to the correct answer, especially considering the simplicity of our calculation and the assumptions that went into it. Okay, that's how heat transfer works.